Hail and welcome. Paul here once again. Now, in my last lecture, we talked about how the Carolingian mayors of the palace would create a Frankish royal dynasty that would supersede the line of the Merovingian kings. Starting after Charles the Hammer Martel defended Gaul from the Arab invader in the Battle of Tours and being finalized when his son Pepin the Short was crowned as King of the Franks by Pope Zachary. After Pepin had become Duke and Prince of the Franks, he saw it unfit that he should still be subject to the Merovingian king, who at the time was named Childeric III, a mere Roy Fainéant, a do-nothing king. So Pepin sent a letter to the Pope asking, In regard to the kings of the Franks, who no longer possess the royal power, is this state of things proper? Now, at the time, Rome was besieged by a Germanic tribe called the Lombards, and the Pope saw in Western Europe an intolerable condition of instability and corruption that he felt would be under greater control if the King of the Franks actually wielded the power of a king rather than just being a mere figurehead. And so it was that the last Merovingian king, Childeric III, would be deposed and confined to a monastery, and Pope Zachary would crown Pepin the Short as Rex Francorum, King of the Franks laying the constitutional foundations for the exercise of royal power. Now, Pepin took a particular interest in church matters and had a strong bond with the papacy. He put into practice the idea that the king of the Franks would be a spiritual leader as well as a political and military leader. Kings would have previously been pious, but Pepin really saw himself as a monarch who wielded the power of God. He was also known for establishing what would be called the Papal States, the region in Italy around Rome that would be governed directly by the papacy. In 754, Pope Stephen II would travel to the Saint-Denis Basilica in Paris to give King Pepin a second anointing, as well as his two sons. After Pepin's death in 768, his kingdom would be divided between these two sons. Southern Francia would be ruled by his younger son, Carloman, and the north would be ruled by his older son, Charles, who would become known throughout history as Charles the Great, which in Latin is Carolus Magnus, and would evolve into the French name that he would forever be known as Charlemagne. Carloman and Charlemagne would rule the divided Frankish kingdom with their mother Bertrada ruling as queen regent to both of them. They were known for their sibling rivalry and not always seeing eye to eye, most notably in 770 when Charlemagne led a campaign against Aquitaine, a campaign that Carloman did not approve of, where he crushed a rebellion and also subdued neighboring Gascony, which at the time was ruled by a group called the Basques. Charlemagne was most certainly 
the more ambitious of the two brothers. Carloman mysteriously would die in the year 771. But was it really a mystery? Or was this Charlemagne's attempt to rule the entire Frankish kingdom? Regardless, in the year 771, Charlemagne proclaimed himself Rex Francorum, King of the Franks. And one of his first acts as king was a campaign against the Lombard Kingdom of Northern Italy. Now, as I said before, the Lombards had become a thorn in the side of the papacy. They had been Christian since the early 7th century, first following Arianism and then Catholicism. However, they were still a nuisance to the Pope with their hunger for power. The conflict between Charlemagne and the Lombard king Desiderius started in 768, when the Frankish kingdom was jointly ruled by both him and his brother Carloman. In 770, Charlemagne was married to Desiderius' daughter Desiderata, though that marriage was brief, and he set her aside to marry a Frankish noblewoman named Hildegard. In response to this perceived slight, Desiderius conspired with Carloman against Charlemagne, and a civil war would break out between Charlemagne and his brother in consort with the Lombard king. After Carloman's death in 770, Desiderius made repeated attempts to get the Pope to recognize Carloman's sons as kings of the Franks. The Lombards were increasingly becoming more and more of a threat to the Papal States, and Pope Adrian I requested Charlemagne's intervention. And in 773, Charlemagne led his armies in the Siege of Pavia, the capital of the Lombard Kingdom. This was all in accordance with the pledge made by his father, Pepin, to Pope Stephen for the Frankish crown to protect the Papal States. Charlemagne's host consisted of between 10,000 and 40,000 troops. The Franks first surrounded the Lombard capital and then successfully subjugated the Lombard kingdom and overthrew Desiderius. After that, Charlemagne began to refer to himself as Rex Francorum et Langobardorum, King of the Franks and the Lombards. Now, Charlemagne was not just a fighter. He was also known to be quite the lover. Throughout the course of his life, he had five wives and five concubines. At the time, monogamy was not something that the church strictly enforced. That would come much later, and it was expected for kings to have multiple partners. With his partners, he had something like 20 children. Throughout the course of his reign, he was able to appoint his sons to govern territories that he conquered. As for his daughters, they lived fairly free lives, though Charlemagne made the effort not to marry them off to anyone too powerful most likely to avoid creating dynastic rivals. So going into the 770s, Charlemagne had acquired more power than any of his predecessors, and the range of his influence 
would only grow throughout his reign. He subjugated Bavaria into paying tribute to him, and in 789, Bavaria was officially in his grip. He also subdued a nomadic tribe called the Avars from around the area that is now Bulgaria, northeast of Italy. And he would acquire the allegiance of three Slavic tribes, the Obotrites and Sorbs from around western Poland, and the Croats from Croatia. Now, not every campaign of Charlemagne's was a success. One of his greatest failures happened when he was attempting to complete what his grandfather Charles Martel had started with the Muslims from Al Andalus. Charlemagne would regularly lead troops into Muslim Spain in an attempt to spread Christianity. He was successful in these campaigns and established across the Pyrenees a military buffer zone that would be called the Spanish Marches. And one time, on his way back from Spain to Francia, he would clash with the Basques, an ethnic group that dwelled in northeastern Spain, as well as parts of southwestern France, like Gascony, as I mentioned earlier. This resulted in the Battle of Roncevaux Pass, where the Basques, allied with the Arabs of Cordoba, were victorious, and Charlemagne's army was defeated, and among the slain was a military commander named Roland, whose deeds would be commemorated in the 11th century poem, The Song of Roland, one of the most important pieces of medieval literature. The poem tells of Charlemagne's 12 paladins, his 12 most trusted knights, and their campaigns against the Muslim Saracens in Spain that would be led by Roland. The poem would gain popularity during the First Crusade when European Christians were being encouraged to take up the cross and fight to take back Jerusalem from the Saracen invader. So in the High Middle Ages, the Song of Roland became a big piece of anti-Muslim propaganda in France. Now, one of Charlemagne's hardest-fought campaigns, and the campaign that he is often most remembered for, were his campaigns against the Saxons in northern Germany, in the region called Saxony. Now, many of you, I am sure, already know that 300 years earlier, a confederation of Angles, Saxons, and Jutes migrated to Britain and pushed the native tribes west, laying the groundwork for the nation that would be known as England. This was the same time that the Franks were beginning to settle in Gaul. However, many Saxons stayed behind in Germany and were able to more easily prosper as they would no longer have the issue of overpopulation. By the 8th century, the distinction was made that the descendants of the Germanic settlers in Britain would be known as the Anglo-Saxons and the descendants of the Saxon tribes that remained in Germany would be known as the Old Saxons. The Anglo-Saxons became Christian around the end of the 6th century, going into the 7th century. This was a fairly peaceful series of conversions, with Irish and Italian missionaries preaching to kings and their nobles. 
The old Saxons, however, would convert to Christianity much later, and it was not brought upon them very peacefully. They believed in the old gods. Wotan, Donner, Saxnot. They sacrificed to the spirits of the land and believed in the divinity of nature. They were pagans. Many Anglo-Saxons would travel from Britain to their ancestral lands to bring the word of God to their continental cousins. Most notably, St. Boniface of Devonshire, who preached to the old Saxons and the Frisians and famously traveled to the German town of Fritzlar to chop down Donner's Oak, or Thor's Oak, a sacred tree symbolic of the God of Thunder. Charlemagne too would chop down a tree sacred to Germanic paganism. However, Charlemagne's axe would cut more than just trees. Now, Charlemagne's campaigns against Saxony began pretty early on in his reign, in 772, one year after he became the sole ruler of the Franks. And they raged on throughout the duration of his reign. The Old Saxons had been a threat to the Frankish kingdom prior to Charlemagne, being raiders and pirates, and Charlemagne's predecessors fought many battles against the Saxons, which would often result in truces. But in 772, when a Saxon horde attacked Frankish territory and burned the church in the Dutch town of Deventer, Charlemagne knew he needed to assemble a host and attack. He led his troops into the North Rhine-Westphalia and captured the fortress of Erisburg. It was around this time that Charlemagne chopped down the Ermensoul, a sacred pillar representing the world tree the tree that holds up the sky, an act that the old Saxons saw as being a great abomination, an attack on the Germanic pagan religion. This sent a message throughout Saxony that the king of the Franks was set on conquering and spreading the faith. After moving his troops north towards the Weser River, and obtaining more strongholds, a truce was made, and hostages were exchanged. But after Charlemagne shifted his attention south to deal with the Lombards, the Saxons revolted under the banner of a formidable warlord. His name was Widukind, a warlord of the Westphalians. Now, the Old Saxons were not just one tribe, but a group of tribes. They were split into four. The Westphalians, the Eastphalians, the Angrians, and the Nordalbingians. These tribes were all ruled by different tribal chieftains with no centralized power. Between 773 and 777, Widukind of Westphalia led rebellions against the Franks, raiding churches and killing missionaries along the Rhine. Charlemagne's second campaign against Saxony occurred in 775, when he conquered the Westphalian fortress of Siegeburg. He then conquered Angria, and then finally, he defeated the Eastphalians and their leader Hesse converted to Christianity. All of Saxony, except for Nordalbingia, was under his control. 
but the Saxons would not stay quiet for long. And Widukind led a rebellion at the fortress of Erisburg. The Franks would crush this rebellion. And Widukind went into exile in Denmark in the court of King Siegfried. In the year 777, Saxony was made part of the Frankish kingdom. All pagan practices were outlawed, and many Saxons were forced to be baptized. He appointed Anglo-Saxon missionaries from England to come teach their continental cousins the word of God. They knew that the Saxons were a proud people and that they would be hard to break. One such English monk, Alcuin of York, one of Charlemagne's closest advisors, attempted to urge leniency and tried to tell Charlemagne that the word of God should not be spread through violence. But it was no use. Charlemagne's bloody crusade against paganism continued into the 780s. Also around this time, Charlemagne was campaigning against the Sorbs in Poland, and Widukind returned from Denmark, perhaps with Danish reinforcements, attacking many religious centers and eventually defeating the Franks in the Battle of Suntul. All the Saxon tribes, and some Frisians as well, would abandon Christianity and return to practicing paganism. And to Charlemagne, this was not okay. And so it was that in the October of 782, Charlemagne would issue the Bloody Verdict of Verdun, or the Massacre of Verdun, where he ordered the beheading of 4,500 Saxons, and the River Aller flowed red with blood. This savage act of genocide would forever be seen as a stain on Charlemagne's legacy, and even his contemporaries have a hard time justifying his actions. Eventually, in the year 785, Widukind would submit to baptism with Charlemagne as his godfather, and the old Saxons would come to convert to Christianity, though reluctantly, as it was forced on them by the point of a sword. Charlemagne would thenceforth gradually turn Saxony into a duchy in the Frankish Empire. There would be uprisings throughout the 790s, even going into the early 800s. Charlemagne crushed these rebellions, and by the beginning of the 9th century, Charlemagne had issued the Le Saxonum, the Law Code of Saxony, and had built churches throughout the land and established six bishoprics. In the coming centuries, with the power of the Christian God, the old Saxons would completely supersede the power of the Franks in the East. But that is a story for way later in this series. So by this time, Charlemagne had acquired more power than any of his predecessors. He had become the most powerful ruler in Western Europe since the days of the West Roman Empire. And with all the sons that he fathered on his many lovers, he was able to appoint dukes to govern the many regions that he conquered. His kingdom was, in many ways, a throwback to Rome's former glory. Now, one of the major differences being that he conquered barbarian territory east of the Rhine 
where Rome was not able to extend its influence. The former West Roman Empire also consisted of Britain, which Charlemagne did not attempt to make part of his empire. During Charlemagne's time, the most powerful monarch in Britain was the Anglo-Saxon king of Mercia, Offa. Charlemagne famously sent a letter to Offa declaring that the two monarchs were equals. He also gave refuge to Alfred the Great's grandfather, King Ecbert of Wessex, during his exile. Now, in addition to being a fighter, a lover, and a diplomatic statesman, Charlemagne was also a connoisseur of education and culture. He was a Renaissance man ahead of his time. In fact, he ushered in something of a Renaissance, the Carolingian Renaissance. Now, when you hear the word Renaissance, you probably think of the Renaissance, the 15th and 16th centuries, the period after the Middle Ages. But the word Renaissance really just means a flourishing of ideas, where culture prospers and great thinkers do great things. Now, this whole period, the early Middle Ages, the period between the 5th and 11th centuries, is often referred to as the Dark Ages. And it is called that because it was seen as a major setback in progress after the fall of Rome, with all the innovations from the classical period, everything from trade to art to education, all collapsing. Charlemagne made the effort to bring that prosperity back. Now, this was not the first time that a renaissance of sorts happened during the Dark Ages. The 7th century, going into the 8th century, saw a monastic renaissance in the British Isles, which inspired Charlemagne, and he brought into his court all the best intellectual minds from England and Ireland, monks and scribes, he built many churches and learning centers all throughout the Frankish realm. This was 30 cathedrals and 417 monasteries. Charlemagne's intellectuals would copy and preserve thousands of manuscripts that would have otherwise not survived. One of the most notable innovations of the Carolingian Renaissance is the script that his monks and scholars would write in, Carolingian Minuscule. It was created so that the Latin alphabet could be easily recognized by the literate class. One of the defining features of Carolingian Minuscule is that it is one of the first scripts that uses spaces between the words, as opposed to the scriptio continuo that was more common prior. So if you've ever wondered why we put spacing between words in sentences, it goes back to Carolingian minuscule. Carolingian minuscule is also known for using punctuation, such as the question mark. Now, another major defining creation from the Carolingian Renaissance is the Palace of Aachen, which is located right where the North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany borders Belgium and the Netherlands. Charlemagne chose this central location as the capital of his empire. Work on the palace began in 794 over the ruins of an old Roman palace, and what you had at Aachen was a large cloistered structure with the council hall on one end where Charlemagne would deal with 
legal matters and govern his kingdom. Uh, attached to the council hall was the Tower of Charlemagne's Treasury Archives, which was also where he stored the many manuscripts that his monks and scholars copied. On the other end, you had the Palatine Chapel, a massive octagon-shaped triple chapel that you can still see to this day. The Palatine Chapel was designed to recreate the image of heavenly Jerusalem in the Book of Revelations. It was a two-story building, and Charlemagne would sit elevated on his throne on the second floor. By doing this, Charlemagne presented himself as being a divine monarch seated upon a heavenly throne. The Palace of Aachen was a symbolic representation of Charlemagne's accumulated power. By the end of the 8th century, Charlemagne was on the top of his game. There seemed to be no way he could become more powerful. Or was there? On Christmas Day in the year 800, Charlemagne was crowned as Emperor of the Romans by Pope Leo III at the old St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. He was the first emperor in Western Europe since the fall of Rome 400 years prior, and the first Holy Roman Emperor, a title that would be used by German kings for the next thousand years. Now, leading up to his coronation was a series of strange events. The Pope was in a feud with his predecessor, Pope Adrian. And after Adrian's death, his relatives kidnapped Leo and supposedly attempted to blind him and cut out his tongue. But he fled to Charlemagne, who he had summoned to Rome to intercede with this conflict. And while Charlemagne was in Rome, Pope Leo crowned him Imperator Romandorum, Emperor of the Romans. Now, Charlemagne's biographer, Einhard, claims that Charlemagne had no idea that he was going to be crowned as emperor when he walked into that church on Christmas Day. And that has been a topic of debate to historians for centuries. Did Charlemagne really not know that he was going to be crowned emperor? Or was it all part of a plan? Now, not everybody approved of Charlemagne being given the title Emperor of the Romans, as there already was an emperor in the East, in the Byzantine Empire, which did not collapse in the 5th century, and at the time was actually ruled by a woman, an empress, Empress Irene, who was in a feud with the Pope. Now, the papacy was tired of having to answer to the Byzantine emperor in Constantinople and for centuries were yearning for an emperor in the West. Charlemagne's coronation was seen in Europe as a turning point where the West would return to glory. Now, although the whole point was to revive the idea of there being a West Roman Empire and an East Roman Empire, Charlemagne's coronation would be the root of conflict between the East and West, who for centuries to come would make competing claims of sovereignty over the entire former Roman Empire.
Charlemagne spent the remaining years of his life in his palace at Aachen, holding imperial court and living a rather excessive lifestyle. For someone so pious, he was known to commit more than one of the seven deadly sins, for his was a reign of wrath, envy, pride, and lust. He was also known for his gluttony. During his reign as Holy Roman Emperor, he developed health problems because of his diet, and his doctors had advised him to switch from roasted meat to boiled advice that Charlemagne had trouble adhering to. He also supposedly tried to keep an elephant at the Palace of Aachen, which you can imagine did not go very well, as elephants cannot survive very well in the cold climate of Northern Europe. On January 28th, 814, Charlemagne died. He died in his deathbed with his family members, nobles, and most honored members of his court at his side. And he was buried in the Palatine Chapel in Aachen. After his death, the empire would be ruled by his pious son, Louis who would be known throughout history as Louis the Pious. Though Louis's death saw a return to Frankish inheritance laws, and the Carolingian Empire would be split into three by three of Charlemagne's grandsons. But that is a story for next time. Now, something happened around the end of Charlemagne's life that is often brushed under the rug by historians, as it was a failed attempt at a final conquest. And I am bringing it up now, after talking about his death, because it is a good cliffhanger to go into the next lecture with. In the year 804, Charlemagne attempted to lead his forces past the vast expanse of Saxony into Denmark, which was ruled by a king named Gudfrid, who built a system of fortifications across the old Danish-German frontier called the Danewerk, which is today located in Schleswig holstein For the past century, the Danes witnessed the Franks subjugating and forcing Christianity upon the Frisians and upon the Old Saxons during the reign of Gudfrid's father, Siegfried, who gave refuge to Widukind during his exile and perhaps provided reinforcement to Widukind during the Saxon Wars. For the next six years, Gudfrid would lead a series of attacks in Frankish-held Saxony, and Charlemagne would be introduced to a new threat to his kingdom in a race almost unknown to his ancestors, but destined to be only too well known to his sons, as the following 260 years saw the incursion of Viking raiders striking terror on all corners of Christian Europe. It is often theorized that some of the earliest Viking attacks were done in retaliation to Charlemagne's forced conversions to the pagan folk of Phrygia and Saxony. Charlemagne spent his last years witnessing a sneak preview of the horrors that his successors would have to endure. In the year 883, the Benedictine monk Notger the Stammerer wrote of Charlemagne bearing witness to the Danes 
in the last years of his life. Charlemagne, who was a God-fearing, just, and devout ruler, rose from the table and stood at the window facing east. For a long time, the precious tears poured down his face. No one dared to ask him why. In the end, he explained his lachrymose behavior to his warlike leaders. My faithful servants, said he, do you know why I wept so bitterly? I am not afraid that these ruffians will be able to do me harm, but I am sick at heart to think that even in my lifetime they have dared to attack this coast, and I am horror-stricken when I foresee what evil they will do to my descendants and their subjects. Salut. If you enjoyed this lecture, I highly recommend you check out the Heavy Metal Opera album by The Sword and the Cross by the late Sir Christopher Lee, who I'm sure many of you know was a renowned British actor known for playing the original Dracula as well as Lord Summer Isle in The Wicker Man and Saruman in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings. Sir Christopher was a descendant of Charlemagne and also a fan of heavy metal, especially symphonic power metal. The album consists of five acts that go through the conquests of the Emperor, and is the perfect mix of opera and power metal, all tied together with Sir Christopher's booming vocals. In borderland raids, they came in their hordes, ransacking villages, taking the spoils, with nothing to lose and possessions few. Bold, sturdy, fearless, and cruel. Defiance of baptism on pain of death. Tough measures call for me to be ruthless. To set an example to the rebels. Draconian for their worship of devils. For thousand men all dead in one day. They would not renounce the heathen ways. Thirty years of campaigning consumed to subject those pagans to Christian rule. Sun of burning of Vernon, river flowing red with the blood of four thousand men that I did behead. I said, God of Saxon men, I said the blood of the Saxon men, I said the blood of the Saxon men, I said the blood of the Saxon men, I said it at first, I said the blood of the Saxon men, I said the blood of all those Saxon men, I said the blood of the Saxon men, I said the blood of the Saxon men, I said the blood of the Saxon men.